very welcome to both and instead of either or a podcast about integrity medicine and health with me Lena Schalqvist Nygren. Today this interview we are recording in studio 109 and with us we have our producer Fredrik Anka Sjöld. And I'm so honored to present my guest today who is Nora Bateson. Welcome. Nice to be here. Nora, first of all, I would like to introduce you, and I really had to choose among everything that you have on you, your track record. But among others, you are an award-winning filmmaker for the film about your father, Gregory Bateson, that called An Ecology of Mind, that I have seen myself during my education to become a psychotherapist, and I really got really in love with the film. Uh, but you are also... A researcher, designer, writer, and educator, as well as president of the International Bateson Institute based here in Stockholm. Your work brings the field of biology, cognition, art, anthropology, psychology, and information technology together into a study in the patterns in ecology of living systems. You have written one book. You are writing another, your second The first called Small Arcs of Larger Circles that came out 2016, and which is a revolutionary personal approach to the study of systems and complexity. And your, your new book is called Warm Data, that we're going to talk a lot of, I hope, today. And it's planned to release now in 2020. Uh, and I could go on like this, but I will stop now with telling our listener that your work has been presented at the, in the world at the world's top universities as offering audience a lens through which to see the work, the world that affect not only the way we see, but also the way we think. And of course, you, among all the lectures and talks that you have been given so far, you have also have honored us to be both, both a lecturer that we have the, the film of, of in YouTube, and you have been moderated for one of the largest conferences so far that we have had that we invited, among others, Professor Alan Francis. So, Nora, how do you see integrative medicine and health through a system point of view and through the lens of the ecology of health, or should I say the complexity of health? Mm, what a beautiful question. And I think it's... An important question, especially in this time. For the most part, we tend to think of health as having something to do with doctors or maybe something to do with diet and exercise. And we also think of health as being the responsibility of the individual. And I think that what I would like to do just to begin with is to open that up. And begin to think about, well, wh where is the health? When we're talking about health, what are we actually thinking about? Is my health my own? Can I be healthy if my family's not healthy? If my children aren't sleeping, if there's um, an upset in my world, am I really healthy? And if there's an unhealthy aspect in my community. Can my family really be healthy? And if, if we're living in an ecology, a natural ecology, in which the air and the water and the food that we eat is, is contaminated or is, is limited in its capacity to be vital, can we be healthy? So where is the health? Okay, so, so that's that first question of just where, where are the edges of even where we see ourselves and our own health? Um, and then the next thing I think to, to think about is really, is really how the different contexts of our lives come together to produce the conditions that we live within that then produce this thing we might call health, or the lack thereof. In some way, it can be compromised. So that's, of course, economic. 
If you can't afford to take days off or to keep your house warm or to have access to healthy food, if you can't afford to um, to do the things, to, to, to have time to go exercise your body or to, to um, even take part in good hygiene of your teeth or your or your your body how do you get healthy and if if you look at that as an economic question of course what you're going to see is that there's all sorts of societal issues there there's culture there's family there's the the heartbreak and the pain that we carry across generations the shame the blame and so is it is it somebody's own fault if they're coming from a situation where there has been abuse or addiction and they have found a way to survive in that? But that way to survive might include eating too much sugar or sleeping at weird hours or being on the internet or having a, a, an imbalanced relationship with technology. But that's how they have figured out how to get through another thing that was really painful. So where's the health, right? So when I know there's a lot of people out there who have, for example, teenagers that are drinking too many energy drinks and they're up too late on their um, laptops and and they're not eating properly and they're not, you know, their their parents are looking at them like, you need to be outside in the forest playing sports like I did and eating vegetables and can't you just live a healthy life? And the kids are looking at this older generation like, you know, you might as well be asking me to chop my arm off because this is the culture I live in. Don't you see me? Right. So, so where is the health? Do we, do we position that as being the responsibility of doctors to cure the poverty? Is it the responsibility of parents to change the culture? Is it the responsibility of the educational systems to somehow give people the love and the sense of home that they don't have at home? Right. So, I mean, how many people do you know that have come through the educational systems with all kinds of trauma of feeling inadequate that have led to everything from eating disorders to addictions to abusive relationships to feeling like they're, you know, a failure in life? And then there's cigarettes or then there's, you know, other kinds of, um, I don't know. That you different- try to add. You try to fix it. You try to, you know, what we do, we compensate. So where's the health? And I think for me, this is, this is a, a way of looking at this that is going to spread our perception out of the very narrow focus of the question of, is there a pill I can take to make this go away, whatever it is that's happening with you? Or um, who can I blame? Whose fault is it? Yeah. And that is very timely for what's going on right now with the pandemic. Uh, and what I hear and what you're the most expert here in our country and maybe the entire West world is to add complexity to understand something. Uh, when you lectured uh, in our Association, Swedish Association for Integrity in Medicine and Health, I remember something that you said that when your father said that you had a problem, you have a problem, then you, if you have a problem, you add complexity mm. to understand. And I think that that is what we have to do. We have to add complexity because everything you say that this pandemic, it started uh, in uh, February 2020 and it was the Chinese to blame in the first. And then it was the well, uh, maybe it was the United States. I don't, I don't remember. But the blaming was put in somewhere. We wanted someone to blame. What is this? Because we got frightened. And, and then we want to have some, some, you know, easy way to take it out. When is this going to be 
finished? When is this over? And so on. But now I think that everyone understands that this is a very, very complex situation. It's more complex than we even can imagine, even today, when we have had this for more than six months. And so I'm really interested to, to hear you. What, what do you think about this situation? It's definitely complex. Um, and, and sort of the, just to kind of give a basis of what we're talking about with saying that it's complex is a way of saying that there are lots of different processes that are coming together to form this situation. So we might like to start by saying it's a pandemic. We have to deal with the pandemic, but With the lens of complexity, what we're going to do is we're going to say the pandemic is a consequence. Okay, what are the conditions in which the pandemic has arisen and what are the conditions that it's landing into? And and when you start to do that, what you get is a, a lot of information that makes it, on the one hand, much more difficult to just find a solution. Okay. Dealing with a living system is not the same thing as dealing with your car. No. Right. When there's something wrong with your car, you can go to the mechanic and they have a way of thinking about it that is mechanistic and you replace the parts or you fix the broken things. Mm. In a living system, that's totally off the table. You can't do that. Right. Because in living systems, it's all made of relationships. And those relationships are changing. They don't stay static. You cannot just plot them on a map and think that they're going to stay the way they were. So the Sweden in which the pandemic landed in February or March of last year is not the same Sweden today. The virus is also changing. You and I, we can both look at aspects of our lives, you know, actually huge parts of our lives that have been changed from our relationship to our kids and their school, from our relationship to our financial stability and our work, from the way that we dress, what we're eating, how we're talking to our, um, you know, older relatives and friends. Uh, what we expect to do this Christmas, how we think about uh, time off. So much has changed. It has certainly did. And and when you say that, I just want to put into this very important discussion about the pandemic, but many people that think if, if, um, if I say that I'm a systemic psychotherapist, for for an example they say systemic they don't they don't really get the systemic because they think about a car or a computer or something but systemic the systemic perspective that that you are educating in is what you say it's it's a, another a whole another thing what you say another, another thing yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> another thing so would you just tell us a little bit more about your work mm-hmm. with systemic with the, the thing that Bateson Institute what your you, you can start to to tell us a little bit about inst, um, based on inst, the international Bateson Institute and what you do okay please start that so i think you know and the pandemic is a fantastic example to start with but when we're looking at at systemics or complexity okay in both cases what we're looking at is systems that require lots of interaction. Okay. So your body is a system. All right. It's not just your heart. It's not just your skin. It's not just your, um, your visuals or your, your blood system or your skeleton or your nervous system. It's also your, your, your mind, your heart, your family, the way that you think about eating, the culture you live in and so on and so forth. The first thing that we want to do is start to think about the way in which it has been um, convenient to assess living systems as though they were mechanistic and to think, okay, if this is broken, we just fix it. 
And then to look around and basically, if you look at all the problems in the world right now, from the pandemic to the climate, to the culture change, to the political upheaval, to the uh, huge wealth gap, to um, the degradation of our forests and oceans, every single one of these issues is complex. They are not situations that can be solved with simple solutions. They're situations that require another kind of thinking, another approach. And that approach is an approach not to the problem getting solved, but to addressing the way the conditions are producing it. Right. So in terms of the pandemic, which incidentally has um, made my work much easier, because prior to the pandemic, when I talked about people you know, the sort of things we're talking about now. And I would make little lists of things like it's economic, it's cultural, it's this and that. And, and people's eyes would just glaze over. They'd just look at me like, what is she talking about? Just make it clear. Um, but then came coronavirus. And this little itty bitty virus came in and at first it looked like it was a medical issue. And then it became clear, oh, no, no, this is an economic issue. And pretty soon we realized, whew, this is seriously political. And then it was about the media. What is the media saying about this? This is a, this is a journalism issue. This is, this is about the media. And then it was like, well, wait a minute. Actually, this is definitely cultural. And every culture is dealing with this in a different way based on, you know, what was in their history. So it's actually a historical issue. And then you look closely and you realize this is about the family. Every family is having to deal with this in a, in, and our families are restructuring. People are stuck in the house and in very close quarters in marriages they don't want to be in, or maybe they are finding themselves you know, in a new way of being in their marriage. Um, suddenly they're with their kids all day, every day. And children are having a completely different relationship to education. So it's an education issue. It's a family issue. It's a, it's a religious issue and spiritual issue. And the older kids in my life are looking around the world going, okay, so, actually, now what's essential? Now what does the future hold? So, prior to the pandemic, it was really easy to think of these things as being kind of one-at-a-time issues. And you have a particular expert to deal with economy and a particular expert to deal with medical and a, one for education and one for family therapy. And, and they were in separate boxes. It's like if these were all buckets of paint, all the buckets of paint have spilled into each other. Mm. And now it's, it's actually not so difficult no, to I talk about that. the complexity yeah. because people get it in a whole new way. And, and, and then once people have been able to perceive that systemic process, suddenly they see it through lots of lenses. Mm. Suddenly we're talking about racism as, as a systemic issue. And it's possible to see all the ways in which the institutions of our world have, have fortified and perpetuated racism. And, and so I just, you know, here are these things that seem so different, health, racism, education, economy, and yet they're all in similar patternings. It's an isomorphy between everyone. I can, I, each and every one that you speak, I can really see that. Yeah. And I have also thought that and think that now is the time for integrity, medicine and health, because this is integrity, med medicine and health for me is systemic. You cannot practice integrity, medicine and health caring without a systemic knowledge or understanding for the human being and how we are totally combined with nature and and uh, our countries and cultures and economy and families and friends and enemies and and the planet system and so on and so forth it's and for just for one year ago this was kind of 
in what we say in in Sweden, flum. <laughs> <laughs> it was impossible to imagine. It was impossible, and and it's has so it's so much that has changed, as you said, that we couldn't imagine could happen. That that our children are home, having practiced homeschool again for one year ago. If we had children that wanted to have homeschool, we got you know kind of. You, as I got from the police officer this morning, <laughs> tickets <laughs> and, and, and what is a pros, uh, pros, uh, unmelan, prosecuted. Yeah, yeah, prosecuted that we couldn't have it. Now everyone is home and we can see f- f- uh, good sides and backsides of this. And we can see good sides and backsides of the old system that we're now leaving because we are in a paradigm, di- paradigm, paradigm, yeah. It's very interesting, and I can really see that you that your work can be much easier from now on because this is we can see this now. Everyone can see this, but they are kind of famlar i mörkret, as you also say in Sweden. We don't know. Do you understand famlar i Because we don't know how to do complexity. We don't know that because we our scientific ground have been, as you said. Uh, we want to fix this. We want to have a pill for this, and we want to have this operation for that. And we want to know the political who we will we choose because this one will make everything good, and so on and so forth. Now we have a complex. We don't know how to deal with this, and it's very interesting. It can happen a lot of good things through this. I think. I think so too. I think it's going to require, though, support. Yeah. It's going to require support of um, of people actually in multiple sectors recognizing that they can't do the job by themselves. And a whole new kind of conversation has to emerge. Mm. A friend of mine from Seattle who's working in social services, which is a town that has a lot of money in it, has a, a the wealth gap has actually gotten out of control. And with that, prior this is prior to the pandemic, uh, there were there's a, a huge increase in addiction and in homelessness, and a lot of people living in their cars. So when you drive from the airport to downtown, there's if you take the side frontage roads, there you can drive maybe ten minutes and see tents and cars where people are living, they where they can no longer afford the rent. There's families living. In those cars. cars. Yeah. Mm. And they're still working. They're Mm. not unemployed. No. They just can't pay the rent. And so there was one story that really struck me as an example of just what we're talking about, where this single mother came into the social services offices to get assistance. And after all the analysis that they had to offer her, they gave her antidepressant pills. Okay, so if you're living in your car with your kids, who would not be kind of depressed because of the circumstances? How optimistic can you actually be? Yeah, right. Right? So at some point, I mean, honestly, if she had come in with a super bright smile on her face, she might she have needed to get mm-hmm. medicated for that. Yeah, what they <laughs> but, think. But they, she needs other... The issue is not the depression, right? And in fact, what ended up happening Mm. there was that that mom who was given those medications was then emotionally a little more distant from her kids Mm. who needed her to be there. They needed her to hold the anger and the frustration for the situation that they were in because they still had to go to school. Yeah. But when their mother was suddenly uh, more absent from the pain that they were feeling, it manifested in their classrooms. Mm. And then those kids start to get behavioral issues. And then they get medicated for the behavioral mm. issues. Mm. So interesting. But where is the... where? So, so we're going to have to have another kind of conversation. A totally other conversation. Because right now we've got, you know, doctors that are basically treating people for their poverty Mm. or treating people for trauma in other parts of their lives that's manifesting in one kind of behavior or health issue or another. The the thing won't stay in the box. When you have a complex issue, it's not boxable. 
And so to have expertise that is boxed, it's like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Mm. We're just unprepared. It's, totally. We're just completely unprepared for the kind of complexity that we have to go into at this point, which has been very evident through the coronavirus. Mm. Particularly, and this is the most kind of difficult issue, is the cultural issues. Yes. Because you just don't know where those are going to come up or how they're going to manifest. If you look at how each country has responded to the coronavirus, there's all sorts of cultural issues mm, going mm, on. Mm. And so you might like to think, oh, this is about science and research, yeah. and then that there's going to be governmental um, response to the science and the research. Yeah. But actually that response has to be, um, that response has to be considered through the cultural lens. Okay, so the way in which a lockdown in some cultures is an example or a, a, a communication of safety. It says we're taking this seriously and, and you are going to be safe and, and this, is, this is what is happening here. Now that was something we saw more in the Asian countries. In the Western countries, that, that notion of a lockdown was an insult. It was a it was a violation of your personal freedom. It was not a communication of safety. And so there's all kinds of response to it. Now, think whatever you want to think about the lockdown. I'm just talking about the cultural aspects yeah. of it. Mm, I understand and, that. and how difficult it is to actually figure out how to respond to a pandemic when the response is not as easy as a test tube response. It's a response that is, mm. is emotional and it's built in the history and, and you just, you just don't know what, how people are going to do. The culture is so, and I, I, I think, and I really hope that the culture will have more spot on how important the culture is for everything and and the complexity of what you're saying is that when you're frightened if the the people that is that is the the, the power people that is running the country can't have the their people calm and safe you have a lot of complexity added because then your immune system is was, is going to go down in, in in a bad way when you have a virus because you are so stressed and uh, your body thinks that you have to do something you have to flee or you have to you know everything so it's it's complex and it's very important that the culture is and in in Sweden the culture just to see through the pandemic the culture people the people who are working with the culture they are not taken care of at all the culture in Sweden mm -hmm. and now this is the culture people because culture is so much more you mean the arts right yeah, yeah. i mean the arts okay. the people of art they are not taken care of they are you know they can't it's a lot of people that can't Uh, work with what they can work, but you know we need the the art people to get us through this. That Absolutely. is awesome. that is the thing that we have done for thousands and thousands of years, and we have not taken care of that. We don't understand the important how important these people are, and, and I I would say, but you can see this overall because the doctors and the nurses they want the the power people wanted them into the hospital. We were going to take care of. The, the sick people and so on and so forth. And then the, the COVID patient, it, the virus get down through in the summer. And then, okay, what happened? They said that, okay, everyone in the new Karolinska is uh, put on. Well, you got to notice that you had to quit. Maybe you had to quit because we don't need you anymore. And then just a month before we were going in, they just, it was on us, nurses and doctors and so on, that was going to to take care of all of this that was happening with the pandemic. It's something about not take, understand the system of what everyone on every spot, how important we are mm -hmm. through something of this we are talking about today, uh, that we have lost. We don't, we don't value, we don't value the soft thing. We, we, we value the 
statistic. We value the scientific ground with the nature scientific things. We don't understand things or we, we, we the people understand, I think. We do that because we have the climate crisis, the spot on the climate crisis, which we also are in right now. We had the spot on, on that before the pandemic. And then we have this Black Lives Matters that started in the United States and so on. So we have a kind of big things that is turning us around totally. And it's going to change us in the ground and where the culture is speaking to us what is happening. The culture is speaking of the systems changing and what we're going to, and, and uh, maybe also what we have to do. What it brings up for me is, is the relationship between the idea of health and the idea of safety. What does it mean to be safe in a changing world? Uh, and, and that's a, a question that is not just about your physical safety, but your economic safety, your the, the safety of, of knowing that who you are will be respected by the world around you. Uh, and I think as we look at some of the, uh, the kind of the, the vitriol and the, the meanness that we're seeing in identity politics and all over the internet and these kind of polarities of, of, oh, I mean, you can split everybody a thousand directions right now. What is it to be safe? And, and part of this question, I think, comes down to the exact same question as health, which is how do we actually respond to a complex world where things are changing across multiple contexts simultaneously. And what people would like to do is have things stay the same. If we could just have it stay the same, then we could, that feels safe. The change feels unsafe. But on the other hand, how it has been wasn't safe either. So um, if you stay the same, that's very, very dangerous it's in a changing very, world. Yeah. But to change everything doesn't feel safe. And I think in particular, this puts politicians in an interesting and difficult position because they need to be able to respond to a world that is very different than the platforms they ran on or what they promised their constituents or, or you know, the, the world of eight months ago is not the same world now. No. And so whatever our politicians promised us eight months ago it's kind of irrelevant at this point. So now the question is, who are they and can they be can they be creative and can they be responsible and respectful in the moment to to circumstances that are emergent. Okay, so this is kind of a a criteria for a politician or a new leadership that's totally unheard of. Um, and, and I think, so this question of safety is right in the same pot as this idea of what is integral health, because I don't see how we can think about health without thinking of it as an integrated process, um, through multiple contexts of, of our lives, our children's lives, our elders' lives, the lives of, of all of the organisms. Okay. Whatever I, my body is something like you know, 400 trillion organisms or something in my body, right? So is my health even my own? You know, if I don't take care of those organisms. Right. And if I don't, as a mother, we are two mothers, uh, my health is very important for my children, for my family, for my work, for my uh, bidrag to the society and so on and so forth. So it's so complex. And it's been an interesting history where we've seen, I mean, I, I think that we've seen the medical systems have had to take on the responsibility for the consequences that other systems have brought about. So we have... Um, you know, if you if you look at some big cities in the world, they have a lot of uh, citizens that have lung illness. And the lung illness is, of course, coming from the pollution. The 
aspects of the economy that are upheld by those processes that are producing the pollution are not paying for the health care. So, or we have, you know, issues going on in school systems where kids feel um, inadequate or they get deeply psychologically hurt by the way the school is set up and in relation to their family or whatever else. And they come out of schools and, and begin to develop addictions. Okay, but that addiction becomes a problem of the medical system and has nothing to do with the school system. In the same way that we have agriculture that is producing food that has all sorts of um, pesticides that are undermining the um, intestinal and microbiome of our bodies, not to mention the soil and the oceans. But when the microbiome begins to malfunction and you start to get, you know, colitis and all sorts of other issues all the way into psychological issues, um, because we now know that the microbiome also is, um, is contributing to our mental health. Those companies who are working in agriculture have no responsibility whatsoever for our mental health. It's not their department. And here you go. This is an example of exactly the same pattern as the single mother who's living in her car getting given antidepressants for her poverty. Right? And so this is where the 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 project, I think, of integral health um, is really a communications project. It's really a project of mutual learning. How do we actually bring these different um, silos of people together, not to get the medical perspective, the economic perspective, the unemployment perspective, the housing perspective, the education perspective, because that would be like switching the channels on your TV. Okay, we don't need panels of people who are experts all giving their opinions. We need groupings of people who are experts who are ready to learn together. And I was I was thinking when you talked about the polit politician. Politician. Mm -hmm. <laughs> politician. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Where, uh, because I think that they have to step up and understand this, that we have to see on different con different countries with different cultures. We have to see in different people with different we we like to see that inte integrative how do you say integrative medicine integrative integrative Inte integrative yeah. integrate yeah. yeah yeah we know what we mean we know <laughs> what we mean either way is fine it's uh, it's a very personal centered treatment when you talk about this i i come back to the thing that you said about pol politicians uh, that they have to step up to show that they can have an understanding for the system thinking Kind of, I always come back to the old Greek, the Socr Socr Socrates uh, dialogues, mm -hmm. where you put yourself together. Maybe they do, but they have to show us that they do, that, that we, we have to add in a mutual learning, as you said, to, to know, to understand new things about our new world, because this is a new world that we are approaching, and where you can take in people that can teach them how to think in a systemic way, in a mutual learning about all this complexity. According to integrative medicine uh, and health, integrative care, we like to see that is kind of personal-centered treatment, where you see that the unique person with all her uniquenesses as the mother who was in the car, that to see what, what is she in a kind, what kind of situation is she is with her children and her maybe a husband or her relatives and the economy and everything about the situation she is in. And maybe she has, she would be useful to have a prescription of depression to come up from this. We don't know or not, mm. but we have to understand the complexity of the own situation. So we like to see that is kind of what we call person-centered person treatment where we have a lot of knowledge we are different people different caregivers that can understand something about the 
person or the family or the couple or the uh, system of relatives or the um, on the work the work group or so on and so forth and that would I would say our politician polit- politiker have to understand on so many levels the real question that I think we get in trouble with is uh, time people being sick or unhealthy is time not at work. And so here we have this giant economic system this that's chugging along like a big train. And um, if people don't participate in it, it doesn't work. If they get sick, we have to get them back in as quickly as possible. And that is, in, in that sense, you can get a quick relief of symptoms from a pill. But what you're not going to do is actually deal with the the conditions that produced the problem. And so that fix is going to be a quick fix that's going to lead to more consequences and more problems. So the, the culture of having a, a quick fix, of having a way to just you know, like your body was a car to take it to the mechanic. And the doctor is not the mechanic. Um, And the system that we're living in, the economic and, and societal systems are in fact making us sick and then producing a, a healthcare system that is not geared to actually generate health, but to keep the other system going. So the whole thing is off track. And um, that's going to be hard to admit. It's going to certainly be hard to admit. And But we are going to talk about it. We are going to think about it. The people think about it. So the, the power people have to listen. If they don't do it now, they are going to be in the future. Because we are thinking about why was it the old people that was more most sick? Yeah. Is it... Um, Uh, institutional where they are is it the lack of relatives or is it the food or is it the statement they are in or is it whatever it is but something was going on that got the old people more sick all over the world certainly different between if we see in in uh, in different countries and different cultures and that will be very interesting when I just say it loud uh, right now to you that the Asians, they have handled this pandemic better than we have. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, they had a, a first round of it. It's not their first time to this. Mm, of course. You know, to this. They have knowledge movie. to deal with this yeah. kind of things. <laughs> They've been to this yeah. circus before. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think that SARS was a lot more extreme. So they had a, a much more extreme first round of it. But I think the there's all sorts of questions that I would say go back decades or, or more around the ways in which um, Western cultures treat elderly people. How do we treat our elderly? And and what is the what is the way in which their contribution to the coming generations has or or hasn't been valued? That's a that's a question. And I think that question is at the heart of all of those things that you listed uh, around, you know, is it the food? Is it the institutions? Is it they, no one came to see them? Are they, are, is it their bodies that have not got the right, you know, sort of hormone balances in them or, or existing or minerals or right. whatever? Yeah. Ultimately, I think what we're looking at is a question of how we live together. And it wasn't easy to uh, to watch the tragedy of losing so many elders um, to this pandemic and to see the dismissiveness which it was carried. I, I heard all too many people saying things like, oh, well, they were going to die anyway. Um, and, and that was alarming, actually. 
It was alarming. Um, uh, not because death is unnatural. Death is absolutely part of health. Yeah. Okay. It so is. that you don't. Our dying is very important. Dying is very mm. important. To... So it's not that. I understand it's not that because I think we are interested and agree about, about the dying process that can be very beautiful. But this was not a beautiful thing that was going on. It wasn't beautiful. There was something um, about the willingness to uh, make a trade. Not only that, it was a false trade. Because here we are in a in an, another round of this, the second wave at least. I think that that what is actually happening is that we're having to really rethink how we think about health. So uh, this quite your work on inter integrative health is is absolutely critical. Hmm. I um, think so too. And I think it's time. And I think that we are kind of prepared to understand this now because I have also been working with integrative medicine and integrative care for so so many years now but suddenly people know exactly what I'm talking about mm -hmm. so it's very kind of prepared to understand something more about integrative medicine integrative care and the, it's it's not an in contradiction to say so contradiction to ordinary healthcare at all it's ad it's kind of, we need that too, but we need so much more to add to healthcare Absolutely. and to understand healthcare. That is one thing. We are kind of one of the world, our Sweden is one of the world best in intensive care, in uh, acute ward in, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. But we are not good at the complex thing, uh, complex diseases. We are to understand the and what I working as a psychotherapist now it kind of kind of come to a spot on the mental health because the mental health is so many people are now in not feeling good in the mental health there are so many to who comes to my practice and to my colleagues and and to to, to the ordinary psychiatry now it's a, it's a storm and this is coming through and it's just not the pandemic because it started before. It was the climate issue, the climate catastrophe that we are having right now that we are seeing parallel to this pandemic thing that is taking the vision of the future from our kids because it's very, much, it's very many young people that is coming to us with anxiety, with depression, with and so on. And I, I would say that... I would like to see it. It's very sad. It's painful. It's very alvarligt. Uh, uh, but we can also, if we add, if we take care of this, we can do very good things. Because, as you said, the old world, the old way to live, the old world, world uh, the old way to see in uh, the problems, it's old. We have to see in a new one, and we have to learn together, mutual learning. And we have to do that with the with our young people. Absolutely, I I think that um, you know it, it's not healthy to be in denial of the fact that there is change. You know, it's like we're on a boat and the captain's like, the boat's not sinking. Everything's perfectly fine. We're going to just go right back out to sea, and everything's going to be good. And the boat is sinking, and. The, everything is not fine and we are not going back to normal. And the future that used to be, is this great line from a sci-fi book a long time ago that said the future is not what it used to be. And the future is not what it used to be. And, and it's, I think really it's on our generation to admit it. We have to actually admit it. The, the world is changing and it's got to change radically and we don't really know how to do it, but we're going to work on it together. And then it becomes okay. You know, that's safe. When the captain says, the ship is sinking, I'm not really sure what's going to happen here, but we're going to figure it out together and we appreciate your help and we'll do this together. Then it's like, okay, there's a dignified, intelligent, reasonable, Improvisational response. 
that says, look, we're all intelligent people here. We can do this. We see it. We, we see the problem. Yeah. We see the acute uh, situation that we are in and we, we are going to handle it. But we to, are going to, yeah. Yeah. But just yeah. to keep going, like we're going to keep going and mm. everything's going to no, stay the no. same because we simply don't have the imagination to, or the courage, you know, it's really the courage to admit that the way things have been set up isn't working. It hasn't for it hasn't for a long time. I'm to be honest. So the changes that are here now, they've been coming for so long. And you can take it. Uh, I'm also working as a family therapist, and if you have a family where everyone you have this pink elephant in the room, nobody talks about. Everybody is continue as they always have, and and then you get. People doesn't feel with the mental health issues. Mm -hmm. The children are not going. The, it can be really, really serious problems in the family. But since you start working, when someone says that we have really, we, we really got a problem or we are going to have a divorce or something, but we are going to handle this. It's, gonna, it's like, you know, everyone <laughs> can start live again. We have said word. We have seen. We have taken whatever we have to do about the situation we're doing. We're learning together. We do this together and we're going to find out what's going, what's going to be the best. And it's a process. The whole life is a process. <laughs> <laughs> But we are seeing it and we're doing something with it. We're not de in denial. And, uh, you know, it's kind of totally isomorphy between all these patterns that we are talking about. That is very important. And somewhere in there we have this issue of... Um... I, th I think we've seen this with the pandemic quite a bit, where when someone suggests that there's a change or that there's some sort of dramatic course shift, then immediately there's the assumption that someone has something to gain from that. And so it's not trustworthy. And, and that, that's been all over the pandemic of people being paranoid that whatever the shift was, it was a shift that was benefiting somebody besides them. So you're leaving all of the buses running because you want to keep the economy going and you don't care that we're dying because it works for you that the economy is still going. Right. Or you're locking us all down and telling us to wear masks because you're actually, you know, making tons of money in tech and in and in all these other, you know, places. So it's it's, it's to your betterment and to your agenda that I have to make compromises. So I think before we can actually get to the type of um, kind of integrative process. There is something big. There is another pink elephant in the room, which is the what's in it for me elephant. Mm. And, and this is like a, a, a premise, a baseline of modern society that somehow it's a given that everybody is asking in every relationship at every moment, what's in it for me? And so we assume that everybody's asking that. What's in it for me? If we keep doing that, if that doesn't change, I don't know how to change these other things because you start to bring these different groupings of people together and the assumption is that somebody has something to gain from it and you can't really tell who it is. And then you get the fake news and then you get the all sorts of pushback and fear of someone's taking something from me and I don't even know what it is. I, I think that that is, is something to be considered in the heart of all this is, a, it, and that's the culture. Okay. That's, it's not even the economy. It's a culture of what's in it for me. Mm. What's in it for me is that you and I and the future and our children and the generations and the oceans and the forests and the the other living organisms are producing health. Okay. Where does health come from? Health comes from relationship. Vitality is produced in relationship. 
So if the relationships are untended or are edited out, you're going to lose health. You're going to lose vitality. So the question of how do we bring more vitality in is a question of bringing in relational process. And how do we trust, as you said before, with what's in it for me? How do we trust? How can we go into a mutual learning with trust that now we do this together? Uh, kind of what is in it for us with everything, with the forest, with the oceans, with the people, with the culture, with the economy, with the politicians. I think that in countries with war or very serious processes, you have this position as people, of course, they have, you have seen that through a lot of wars that you have this, that you put yourself in different positions and, and uh, blame each other or You know, the war is a position to war against each other, to fight against each other. But you have groups where you can start to stop doing this. What's it, what is in it for me? Where you start to collaborate with each other just to survive. So maybe you have to have also a serious issues to see what you're... If I, if I am in a serious situation... Maybe then I can see my own issues where I have been doing all this, what's, it is, what's in it for me and see that it's not, it's not worth it. The, it's exactly what you say. It's the relationships that is worth. If I have relationship with the people around me that I value, mm -hmm. I can build up something new. I can uh, regain my health. I can help other people and then I am in statement of happiness or joy or feeling worth or and, and so on. It's so much. Everything comes through relationship. And with this pandemic, we are also torn apart. So then we can have, because we are in a digital world, we can have contact. We, cannot, don't, we can't have the physical contact, but we can have a digital contact. But the mental health issues is rising uh, anyway. So, so that is something that I am thinking about a lot with this relational situation. In the world. I'm not the only one. They are talking, they are writing, they are speaking, we speak and, and so on and so forth. But this is something that is very, very important for us to go through this in a good way. And it's complex. What do you think about that? I think that I had a moment of hoping that the pandemic would be that thing that would wake us up, where people would say, we have to work together to do this. But the currents of um, cultural, technological, um, political discourse and, and sentiment were stronger. And it's actually divided people. I mean, you know, being in Sweden, I, I was so surprised to see how the people who questioned the Swedish Uh, strategy got just eviscerated by journalists, by people, by their own friends, by family, by, and, and that doesn't seem very Swedish to me. I mean, I'm, I'm not Swedish, but I was surprised that it wasn't okay to question because that seems to me to be at the core of any kind of critical thinking process. So, you know, regardless of what I thought about it, um, I was surprised that there was such a culture of attack that, that for whatever reasons, um, the authorities that produced the path forward, um, I, I mean, honestly, looking at it from the outside, because I'm an outsider, it had a kind of cult-like quality to it. 
It was very scary to watch, not because I agree or disagree, but because it was too charismatic and clothed and it was it, the, something weird happened. And, and that, that was alarming to me, particularly when it turned into, you know, people actually being mean to each other in public spaces. And um, I mean, there were violence in some places where if someone wore a mask, they got attacked or made fun of, or, you know, things were happening that, that shouldn't be happening here. This is a country that is, has a healthcare system, has a lot of, there's all kinds of care here. Um, there was no need for this. This is a, a, a place from, from my perspective, again, as an outsider, um, unlike the U.S., which is, um, you know, in the U.S., people are afraid. If if they get sick, they don't have health care. If most people cannot go to the doctor, if you go, I remember going um, when I was a student to the doctor in in the states, and I I stepped on a nail, and so I went to the um, emergency room, and it cost me thousands of dollars. And I got mail for years about that treatment. I mean, can you imagine coming into your house three times a week? There's a letter on the table from some laboratory or some medical or some insurance or some. I spent hours on the phone dealing with this. So the whole relationship to healthcare in the States is totally different. That was actually another question that I had that I wanted to, to ask you about the during the pandemic also now, if you can see the different cultures about the healthcare system from the United States and Sweden, and what you can see is the uh, good thing about from the state that you see how they have handled this pandemic and the bad side and uh, in relationship to the Swedish handling. Oh, that's a hard question. I, You know, honestly, I... Um... It's very difficult for me to point to any of the good sides. <laughs> I'm sorry. It sounds so so um depressive, but I I mean, you know, they're just um I think it's been really difficult to think about what I mean, look at there's thousands of people dying too much. So, so what we've got in the States is basically we've got, um, we've got nine eleven every three days of people dying. So think about the war and the cost of nine eleven over the last two decades. I don't know. I, it's a disaster. And in the States, it's a disaster, um, at the level of communication. It's a disaster at the level of the health system, the insurance system, it's uh, the food and the health and well-being of the people to begin with, of the density of the population, of the culture itself. I mean, you know, when you get in an elevator with an American, you may have noticed they start talking to you, right? They do. They do. I love it. <laughs> In Sweden, you came onto the elevator, uh, elevator and it's just silence. Yeah. I love when they talk to you. <laughs> but but that means that there's um, transmission. Mm. So there's a, a, a whole different culture of interaction. Um, I, I love this joke that I keep hearing about, you know, Swedes saying, when are we going to get over social distancing so we can go back to standing six meters apart? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so... I, you know, the cult, it's at the level of culture, it's so different. But the idea that you just have medical care, okay, I don't know if it's possible for you to imagine what it would be like to live in a world in which not only you, but no one around you has that thought yeah. that you could just go to the doctor is not a concept that we share. And so think about what happens when you throw the fear of a pandemic into that pot. And, and so of course, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of deep latent traumas and fears and paranoias and, and 
illusions in all directions start popping up. Um, but there's also this other thing in the States, which is because we don't have any care, we take care of each other. Yeah, and, I see that. And, and, and then, like you said, right now we can't. But still, my mom is 91. She's in an elderly uh, apartment care place in Washington State. And not one single person in her care facility they have, I think they own three different ones. So it's over a thousand elderlies in the, in their care system. Not one person has tested positive. Wow. Not one. That is so awesome. And they, and do you know? They locked it down. They locked it down. Totally. totally. Nobody else is coming nobody in. in the nobody in, nobody out. And the and healthcare persons, the nurses, the doctors, are they living? They, Maybe they don't have doctors. But. They they go in and out to the doctor. Yeah. Um. So it's not they're not locked in from that. But no. when they do, they have you know they're super careful, mm. and they have people playing music outside the building for them. So they come out to their balconies to hear the musicians play. So the musicians are getting a gig, and mm, the yeah, yeah. elderly people, and they can see each other out the window. This is mm. hilarious. Mm -hmm. So they actually have done it in the Vanda. It's so cute. A, a lot of our. Uh, Local artists have done that for the elderly, elderly in different parts of Vanda. It's, so it's wonderful. It's so beautiful. My mother is. Um, I mean, it's over the top too. Okay, so I, you know, they're. I feel like everybody's over the top in one direction. They're too loose or too strict or too this or too that. But, but my mother um, has this this five o'clock moment where she has a drink with her girlfriends on her hallway. And they can't have their drink together because they can't be together. So they stand in their doorways with their cocktails and, and they, but they're deaf, you know, they're old. <laughs> so they're deaf. <laughs> so, so one so, of the women went mm -hmm. on Amazon and ordered three bright green bullhorns, you know, like for the demonstrations. Those yeah. Rah, rah, yeah, yeah. Rah. And so they sit there with their cocktails and their bright green bullhorns and they talk to each other oh, across so the hall. Wonderful. Okay. Like these are some things we didn't mm. see coming. No, no. And that is so spot on how much we want to be in relationships, how important it is for us to be in relationships how much we can do to, to reach out to the other one. Mm. Because that is, actually, that is how to be human. We want to be in our groups with our people, with our animals, of course, and everything, forest, oceans, and so on and so forth. But still, the relationship is totally, it's the most important thing. And we figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there was no municipality or there was no special marketing campaign. There was no political or psychological expert agenda that contributed to the creativity of those women figuring out how to use a bullhorn to have cocktail hour together in their mm. 90s mm. And in lockdown. And that's the thing. You know, when you look at all the creativity that came out of just people wanting to be in... The, the Italians singing... Across yeah. their balconies. So the, the way in which experts could have never given advice for how to keep those relationships alive, how to keep the spirit, the stamina, the morale, the hope. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me, if we were to end on a note, it would be that, that the, the deep integrative process is actually a creative process that we do together and it's beautiful and it's fun and we're human and we're warm this is what warm data warm this is what it's all about mm. is oh, we the warm about warm data that's okay next we time next next podcast this has been the most marvelous interview and dialogue and to understand about this and i'm so happy to have you and i really hope to have you again anytime thank it's you wonderful Laura. to be here thank you so much thank you Thank you.